Okay, today we want to do something a little unusual. We want to show that this box full of gas particles can be explained perfectly by going back to Newton's laws that we learned in mechanics last year. So if you draw out a box, give the box a length, a width, and a height, we have our particles moving around randomly inside the box. We want to prove that we can turn this into this. And the importance of this is to show that these gas particles follow the exact same laws as all the other things that we've studied in mechanics. Okay, so this was experimentally determined to be true, and we're going to show it's a consequence of Newton's laws. So let's give it a shot. Okay, we're going to start with some basic ideas, okay, some preliminary information. The first thing I want you to realize is that when things move, oftentimes they move through all three dimensions simultaneously. So this football might be moving up, it also might be moving down the field, and it might be moving across the field. So when we look at velocity, last year we dealt with simply an x and a y velocity. We did two dimensional motion. And we saw that Pythagorean's theorem could be written using these velocities. When we add a third dimension, it is as simple as throwing a third term into Pythagorean theorem. With our gas molecules, the average particle has no preference in terms of what direction it's moving. All these motions are random. So in general, the x, the y, and the z should all have the same average velocity. So instead of writing three separate terms in terms of x, y, and z, since they're all going to be numerically the same number, we can just use x three different times. Okay, so we're going to have our final expression looking like that, and we are going to rewrite that as our first equation, bx squared is a third of the total velocity. So keep that in the bank, we're going to need it in a little bit. Okay, we can see three-dimensional motion when we look at a corner pin. We can see the soccer ball traveling upwards, down the field, and across the field. Okay, the next one we want to look at is our constant velocity formula, constant speed formula that we had from the very beginning of last year. So we got a particle bouncing around the box, and we want to determine how much time it's going to take to make a round trip. Realize it might be moving x, y, and z, but if we're only looking at how far it's moving in the x direction, we can simply use our x velocity in our speed equals distance over time equation. So we're going to say bx equals 2l over the time of the trip. 2l because the, uh, the particle has to go from one side of the box to the other and back again. So the total time for a trip can be found by rearranging, and we'll put this as our second equation. Again, keep that equation in the bank. We're going to need it for our derivation. Next, we want to look at the acceleration of the particle when it hits the wall. Again, we're only interested in the x direction when it bounces off of the wall. If we were bouncing off the front or the back, or the top or the bottom, we'd be interested in either the y or the z. But for the left and right wall, we only worry about the x velocity. We learned last year that acceleration is the change in velocity over time. Taking into account direction, the change in velocity will be two times the x velocity. So for instance, if this was 10 coming into the wall, it would be bouncing off the wall at negative 10. That would give you a change in velocity of 20. 
two times the original velocity. Notice that the time that we're going to use in this equation is the time of the collision. Okay, how long did this transition take? So this will be our next equation to put in the bank. Acceleration equals 2vx over the time of the collision. Okay, we then want to remember Newton's law. This is going to be the start of our derivation. We're not starting it quite yet, but just to remind you of the formula. Acceleration equals force net over mass. Put this one in the bag. Okay, we want to remember our force to pressure equation. So when this particle hits the wall and creates a force, we want to remember that if we take the force divided by the area, that will equal the pressure on the wall. We're going to average it out over the entire surface of the wall which again would be width and height. So we have pressure equals force over width times height, or force equals pressure, WH. Put it in the bank. To be used later. Okay, so we're gathering up all the formulas we're gonna need for this derivation. The next one to remember is our kinetic energy equation in general, and also the kinetic energy formula that we have for the average particle. So we have kinetic energy equals 3 halves kT, and we have kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared. Okay, we then want to make sure we remember the formula on ways to describe the number of particles in the box. And hopefully we remember, we just did this recently, that the number of particles in the box is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's number. So these are all the formulas that are going to become important when we do our derivation. So let's get to it. Again, what we're trying to do in this derivation is prove that Newton's second law will predict our ideal gas equation. So we have a box full of particles, more than we could ever hope to count. Let's get rid of all of them except for one. Let's watch our object bounce around inside the box. And let's try to focus on this wall and see how much average pressure is put on that wall by a single particle. Then we'll extend it to all the particles. All right, so let's go. We start with acceleration equals force net over mass. We saw that our acceleration is two times the x velocity over the time of the collision, and that will be equal to force net over mass. Clear out your fractions. I'm going to just call it force for now. And remember TC stands for the time of the collision. This is the force present during that collision. Realize that that force is going to happen in just the blink of an eye, and then there'll be no force from that particle for a long time until it hits again. So we're going to rewrite this equation in a slightly different way. And instead of looking at the time of the collision, we're going to average out the force over one complete cycle of collisions. So the average force from the time it hit to the time it hits again. It's kind of like your bank account. Your bank account will have nothing going into it for a long time and then at payday, boom, you get a big influx of money. We're gonna have the same thing with our forces. Nothing, nothing, nothing. A giant force when the particle hits and then nothing until the next week when our next paycheck gets deposited. So this is the instantaneous force during the collision, and this is the force when we average it out over one complete cycle. Okay, we still get our same things. We just change the amount of time, which is gonna lower our force. Again, this is now the average force during one cycle. Okay, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna get rid of the time between uh, collisions, the time of our trips, 
by substituting in this one. And we get 2 mvx equals force times 2L over Vx. As we did before, clear out the fraction. Cancel out the twos. Replace force with the pressure expression. So we have mvx squared equals pressure with height length. At this point, I hope you see that on this side, width, height, length is volume, and we're already at PV, which was half of the equation we wanted to prove was equivalent to our Newton's law. Okay, over here, we're going to get rid of Vx squared by putting in one-third of V total squared. So instead of looking at just the x velocity, we're now putting in terms of the total velocity. It's a shame that it says one-third mv squared because it's almost like our kinetic energy equation. In fact, we're going to force it to be our kinetic energy equation by doing a little mathematical sleight of hand. So I just rewrote one-third as two-thirds times one-half, and hopefully you see that is equivalent to one-third. But by writing it this way, we can now say this is two-thirds times our kinetic energy equals PD. Next, we can take our kinetic energy for an average particle and put it in place of the kinetic energy. And you can see magically the two-thirds and the three-halves cancel out. And we get Boltzmann's constant times temperature equals pressure times volume. At this point, it's important to remember that we are looking at only a single particle. So this is the average pressure from a single particle. To get it to become the total pressure, we simply multiply our expression by the number of particles that we have inside the box. We're then going to use our expression to change that into moles. And voila! Hopefully remember, Boltzmann constant times Avogadro's number is the molar gas constant. And we have proved what we have set out to prove that Newton's laws of motion predict the gas equation. Okay, so this gas that is following this law is really simply following Newton's laws of motion for each individual 